if the stenographer spends all her money on cosmetics and has none left to pay for the use of a microscope for a visit to the doctor when she needs it, she learns a better method of budgeting her income. The free market serves as her teacher. She has no way to penalize others for her mistakes. If she budgets rationally, the microscope is always available to serve her own specific needs and no more as far as she is concerned. She is not taxed to support an entire hospital, a research laboratory, or a spaceship's journey to the moon. Within her own productive power, she does pay a part of the cost of scientific achievements when and as she needs them. She has no social duty. Her own, uh, her own life is her only responsibility. And the only thing that the capitalist system requires of her is the thing that nature requires, rationality, that is, that she live and act to the best of her own judgment. Within every category of goods and services offered on a free market, it is the purveyor of the best product at the cheapest price who wins the greatest financial re rewards in that field. Not automatically, nor immediately, nor by fiat, but by virtue of the free market, which teaches every participant to look for the objective best within the category of his own competence, and penalizes those who act on irrational considerations. Now observe that the free market does not level men down to some common denominator that the intellectual criteria of the majority do not rule a free market or a free society, and that the exceptional men, the innovators, the intellectual giants, are not held down by the majority. In fact, it is the members of this exceptional minority who lift the whole of a free society to the level of their own achievements, while rising further and ever further. A free market is a continuous process that cannot be held still, an upward process that demands the best, the most rational, of every man and rewards him accordingly. While the majority have barely assimilated the value of the automobile, the creative minority introduces the airplane. The majority learn by demonstration. The minority is free to demonstrate. The philosophically objective value of a new product serves as the teacher for those who are willing to exercise their rational faculty, each to the extent of his ability. Those who are unwilling remain unrewarded, as well as those who aspire to more than their ability produces. The stagnant, the irrational, the subjectivist have no power to stop their betters. The small minority of adults who are unable rather than unwilling to work have to rely on voluntary charity. Misfortune is not a claim to slave labor. There is no such thing as the right to consume, control, and destroy those without whom one would not be able to survive. As to depressions and mass unemployment, they are not caused by the free market, but by government interference into the economy. The mental parasites, the imitators who attempt to cater to what they think is the public's known taste, are constantly being beaten by the innovators 
whose products raise the public's knowledge and taste to ever higher levels. It is in this sense that the free market is ruled not by the consumers, but by the producers. The most successful ones are those who discover new fields of production, fields which had not been known to exist. A given product may not be appreciated at once, particularly if it is too radical an innovation. But, barring irrelevant accidents, it wins in the long run. It is in this sense that the free market is not ruled by the intellectual criteria of the majority, which prevail only at and for any given moment. The free market is ruled by those who are able to see and plan long range, and the better the mind, the longer the range. The economic value of a man's work is determined on a free market by a single principle, by the voluntary consent of those who are willing to trade him their work or products in return. This is the moral meaning of the law of supply and demand. It represents the total rejection of two vicious doctrines, the tribal premise and altruism. It represents the recognition of the fact that man is not the property nor the servant of the tribe, that a man works in order to support his own life as by his nature he must, that he has to be guided by his own rational self-interest, and if he wants to trade with others, he cannot expect sacrificial victims. That is, he cannot expect to receive values without trading commensurate values in return. The sole criterion of what is commensurate in this context is the free, voluntary, uncoerced judgment of the traders. The magnificent progress achieved by capitalism in a brief span of time, the spectacular improvement in the conditions of man's existence on earth, is a matter of historical record. It is not to be hidden, evaded, or explained away by all the propaganda of capitalism's enemies. But what needs special emphasis is the fact that this progress was achieved by non-sacrificial means. Progress cannot be achieved by forced privations, by squeezing a so-called social surplus out of starving victims. Progress can come only out of individual surplus, that is, from the work, the energy, the creative overabundance of those men whose ability produces more than their personal consumption requires, those who are intellectually and financially able to seek the new, to improve on the known, to move forward. In a capitalist society where such men are free to function and to take their own risks, progress is not a matter of sacrificing to some distant future. It is part of the living present. It is the normal and natural. It is achieved as and while men live and enjoy their lives. Now consider the alternative the tribal society, where all men throw their efforts, values, ambitions, and goals into a tribal pool or common pot, then wait hungrily at its rim while the leader of a clique of cooks stirs it with a bayonet in one hand and a blank check on all their lives in the other. The most consistent example of such a system is the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics. Half a century ago, 